Daniel chapter 9, part 3. I mentioned last time that if there were only two verses, not even the key verses, but if there were two verses that you could take away from the book of Daniel, they are Daniel chapter 9, verse 23 and verse 24. And you don't have to remember all of verse 23. All you have to remember is you are greatly loved. We're going to spend the rest of the day, the rest of the morning, talking about verse 24, God's prophetic plan for Israel's future. Now, we already covered verses 25 through 27 last class. We're going to talk about this one verse today. It begins by saying, 70 weeks are decreed about your people and your holy city. It's followed by six infinitives, but I wanted to make a note that of those six accomplishments, while they're addressed to Israel, all of humanity is going to be radically impacted. Before Israel got their real estate in 1948, a lot of Bible scholars decided to substitute the church for Israel. That's a big bad mistake. These blessings are meant for your people, Israel, and your city, Jerusalem, we just happen to be benefactors of those Jewish blessings. We'll be looking at this picture several times. Don't bother with the details. I wanted to use this picture to explain the human, the, the rest of humanity impact of the blessings of Israel. So here you see Genesis chapter 12, the Abrahamic covenant. Now the Lord had said unto Abram, get thee out of thy country and from my kindred and from my father's house unto a land that I will show you. In that millennial reign, they are going to have a piece of real estate. The real estate, not that skinny thing that you look on maps today, but the real estate as promised to Abram. And that was from the Nile to the Euphrates. They're going to have a piece of real estate. And I will make of thee a great nation, a great people. And the real estate is going to belong to Israel. They got that sliver today. They're going to get the whole piece. And make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. We're going to see the blessings that fall upon Israel. We're not studying the full millennial reign. That's Revelation chapter 20. You can go out to YouTube and see that thing. But these folks are going to get a super blessing based on those six infinitives. And I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. I wanted to finish this particular verse and explain the blessings and the cursings. The ultimate curse on the nation of Israel was from the Antichrist. In Revelation chapter 19, you see the beast and the false prophet thrown into the lake of fire. After the millennial reign, you'll see the dragon, the serpent cast into the lake of fire. I'll bless them that bless thee. And here's the kicker. This is the point I wanted to make. And in thee, all families of the earth shall be blessed. Now, I'm going to get a blessing totally independent of that because I've been saved. And I'll show this because a lot of people, when you talk about end times, you can see them starting to wringing their hands and the mark of the beast and the guillotine and all this other stuff. I believe in a pre-trib rapture. I believe in a literal millennial reign. When we see verses that talk about the mountains melt, you see verses about the mountains shrinking and the islands fleeing. I believe all that, literally. There are some people that don't. There are some people that don't even believe in a millennial reign. I said, how can you do that? But I'm here to tell you, and I will have a reservation that you'll see shortly. I'm here to explain what I believe and why I believe it. So there are six infinitives in that particular verse. To finish the transgression, to put an end to sin, and to atone for iniquity. Now, all you grammar scholars... If there were a list, you only see the word and at the end of the list. But you see two ands, one in verse three and one in verse six. That means there are two groupings. One, two, and three deal with sin, and four, five, and six deal with righteousness. Putting away 
the negative, bringing in the positive. So they tell you that, tell them what you're going to tell them, tell them, and then tell them what you told them. So here we go. A summary of the six goals of Daniel 924. Everything promised, everything prophesied, everything hoped for by the nation of Israel is summed up in these six infinitives. Now, if we talked about this, this quote came from a commentator. If we talked about the 77s, well, I don't think Israel's hoping to be put into the great tribulation. So let's simply said, everything hoped for is brought to fruition in these six infinitives. Delivering the Jews from the Babylonian captivity. This chapter started with Daniel praying. And he prayed a confession. He said, we as a nation have sinned. And he threw himself in there, first person. We as a nation have sinned. And then he prayed that they'd be given the land back. He prayed that the temple would be re-sanctified. And the response here is, yes, they're going to be given the land back, not the, not the chunk that he left, but the whole piece, the Nile to the Euphrates. And he's going to see the Messiah. And we're going to see as we dig into this, how the Jewish people at the time of the millennial reign will receive the Messiah. The Bible says, and they shall look upon him whom they have pierced. Well, how did their Messiah get pierced if it weren't for the first coming of Jesus, the real Messiah, the coming of that first Palm Sunday? They'll be delivered from their transgression at the Messiah's advent. And we're going to spend a good chunk, a good focus, <clears throat> talking about that word transgression. Because how you view the millennial reign, the kind of sin that's committed, who's going to commit that sin is all based upon the question or the answer to the question, what is the transgression of Jacob? And ultimately, complete deliverance from oppression at the second coming of Christ. When the Pharisees spoke to Jesus and they accused him of being a bastard, they said, we be of Abraham's seed. And they said, we've never been under oppression. Well, they were always under oppression from the Babylonian captivity clear on through the, the Persians, the Greeks, the Romans, and they've been scattered ever since. We're going to see a regathering of, of Israel. We're not going to cover the verse of, of the, today about the Valley of the Dry Bones, but this is what we're going to see. Israel is going to be resurrected and brought back to, to the, the land. Three great milestones, two great recipients. We talked about the two great recipients already. The three great milestones are the first coming of the prince, Palm Sunday, the doing away of sin, Calvary, we're going to see the second coming of Jesus, the setting down of his foot on Mount Olive. And we're going to ask the question, who are the people in that area at that time? And then you see the dotted line over there at the end of the millennial reign? That comes back to the question, what is the transgression of Jacob? So those are the three great milestones, maybe two. That's why the one's dotted line. And those are the two great recipients, Israel and the nations, everybody else. Let's avoid dueling prophecies, dueling calendars. I'd like to share with people what I believe and why I believe it. I was introduced to a concept this week that I need to explore, but I wasn't going to postpone this class because I need to explore that. Uh, I'm going to show you that when the millennial reign starts, every person that comes into the millennial reign is saved. The concept that was shared with me this week was all of the born, those not born again, all those born of Jewish people during the millennial reign are sinless. 
Now, I find that such a very strange concept that a person born after Adam be born sinless. I'm not ready to accept that. But I will show you verses where you can scratch your head and say, you know, it, it could be. And so we're not here to dual prophets, a dual, we have dueling prophecies. We're here to learn. We're here when class is over to get back out there. We'll be talking, of, we'll be reading Isaiah, we'll be reading Zechariah, we'll be reading Jeremiah, we will be reading Ezekiel. And when you see these verses again in your own Bible studies, maybe you'll reflect on this particular verse, Daniel 9, 24. So what is the transgression of Jacob? Micah answers that question for us. Behold, the Lord is coming out of his place and will come down and tread upon the high places of the earth. And the mountains will melt under him and the valleys will split open like wax before the fire, like waters poured down a steep place. And all this is for the transgression of Jacob and for the sins of the house of Israel. So there's the question, what is the transgression of Jacob? And then Micah answers it. Is it not Samaria? What is the transgression of Jacob? It's idolatry. Now the trick here and what you're going to see as I dig deeper into this, you're going to see three X's in brackets. That is there for two reasons. One, for me to comment on this new concept that I was exposed to, but also there for me to do my own studies afterwards. So follow the bouncing ball. To put an end to sin, that, this particular slide I borrowed, but uh, we'll get to numbers one through number six. Ezekiel 36, and I will give you a new heart and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will re remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes and be careful to obey my rules. X, X, X. You read there and you say, he's going to cause the people to walk in the statutes. But my question is this. If a body is born sinless and they cannot sin, they don't have to be careful to obey the rules. Bear with me. They shall not defile themselves anymore with their idols. This goes back to the Micah uh, definition of the transgression of Jacob. They'll not go back to their idols and with their detestable things, or with any of their transgressions. So that could mean any of their sins carte blanche, or it could mean idolatry that doesn't require an idol. What is that? People have been known to worship the sun. People have been known to worship the stars. And you don't need to create an idol because there it is. but I will save them from all the backsliders. Backsliding into sin in general or backsliding into idolatry. If we're talking about simply idolatry, that's where that third red arrow comes in because at the end of the millennial reign, there'll be the great white throne and we'll discuss that shortly and the ages to come. And in those ages to come, there'll be no sin whatsoever. The Bible says the last enemy to be conquered is death. So, three great milestones, two great recipients, which begs the question, during the millennial reign, who are the sinners? Is it Everybody that's been born during that period? Or is it just the Gentiles? Who are the sinners? And what is the nature of the sin? You read in Isaiah that the lion will feast with the lamb. And you read in Isaiah chapter 2 that they'll, they'll make no more war. 
And so the notion of violence will have shrunk. The notion of living longer lives will increase, and we're going to see that shortly. But who are the sinners, and what is the nature of those sins? The Jews will continue to sin, but not idolatry, or the Jews will live without sin. USA. In the past, we lived in a Christian nation. We now live in a post-Christian society. You pick up the newspaper and you can see that. You look at the White House lawn this past week and you can see that. And I can't imagine what's going to happen on the 4th of July. I hope we have a traditional 4th of July. But in the past, we lived in a Christian nation, but of course there were individuals that were lost. Today, our nation is lost. We live in a post-Christian society, but individuals continue to be saved. Praise God. We had a vacation Bible school here. And I hope that we get a report that young kids have come to, Je to see Jesus, to know Jesus. Israel. Today, the nation is lost. We're going to read from Romans chapter 11, how Paul talks about that until the fullness of the Gentiles has been completed. But individuals are saved. I have some observant Jewish friends that I pray, I pray, and I pray for. Then millennial reign the nation will be saved i'm going to show you that will individuals be lost or will all the jewish individuals be saved who 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 and who who is around at the time of the rapture who is going through the great tribulation who is going to be there at the moment Jesus comes back on the Mount of Olives? And who is going to be living in the millennial reign? Who is going to sin and what is the nature of the sinner? So I mentioned to you that some people all of a sudden get a degree of angst when they hear about end times. You know, the mark of the beast and the guillotine and the, the chasing and uh, won't be able to buy or sell anything. We live in a church age. And if you've been saved, you will be raptured. And at that rapture time, this body, this mortal is going to put on immortality. This corruption is going to put on immortality. The church is going to be in heaven during that great tribulation period. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. If you want to know where you're going to be after the rapture, read your Bibles, figure out where Jesus is, and that's where you will be too. The church is coming back. The church is coming back. We're going to witness the battle of Armageddon. And the Bible says that we will rule and reign with him a thousand years. At the end of those thousand years, there is going to be this great white throne judgment. And people say, well, will there, will there be the, the church at the great white throne? We will be there as spectators. The Bible says that Jesus will be surrounded by his host. Well, how do we know that I'll be there? Look at the verse we just covered. We will always be with the Lord. Questions about where the church is going to be. Then came one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues and spoke to me saying, come, I will show you the bride, the, the wife of the lamb. That's me. That's you if you've been saved. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain and showed me the holy city of Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. And I saw no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God, the almighty and the lamb. People ask the question, who is going to live in the new Jerusalem? Am I going to live in the new Jerusalem? Am I going to live in the new earth? Am I going to live in heaven? The concept is this. We will always be with the Lord. To make this very, very simple. And we read here, 
and they say, I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And I saw no city, no temple in the city for its temple is the Lord God almighty and the lamb. The Bible never says that the new Jerusalem hits the earth. It says he sees it coming down from the earth. And if Jesus is going to be in the new Jerusalem, I'm going to be in the new Jerusalem. And if Jesus is going to be in heaven, I'm going to be in heaven. If Jesus is going to be on the earth, I'm going to be on the earth because I'm going to be with him forever. At the time of the rapture, saved people are gone. So by definition, that leaves just lost people, Jews and Gentiles. This is why I'm a big fan of child evangelism. This is why I pray for our kids' Sunday school classes. This is why I pray for vacation Bible school. The coming of the lawless one is by the activity of Satan with all power and false signs and wonders and with all wicked deception for those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore, God sends them a strong delusion. Folks that are alive at the time of the rapture, lost, <clears throat> that have been pricked by the Holy Spirit and have rejected him, they have no chance during the great tribulation period. They're destined to die. They're destined for hell. On the other hand, many Jews and Gentiles will be saved. Folks that had not been pricked by the Holy Spirit. And we read minimally about the 144,000 Jews, and we read about thousands upon thousands of the nations that are being saved. Which begs the question, when all these folks come together, when Jesus sets foot on the Mount of Olives, what's going to happen? They say, John, I thought we we're here to talk about Daniel 9, verse 24. This is all Daniel 9, verse 24. So there's a close-up picture. What's going to happen? The church is coming. They're coming for the battle of Armageddon, the spectators, and we'll rule and reign. The tribulation martyrs are coming. Those that died but weren't martyred will have to wait for the end of the thousand years. The Jews, lost and saved, are coming. And the Gentiles lost and saved, are coming. Now we're going to see in the next few verses that only the saved people step across into the millennial reign. Saved Jews and Gentiles step into the millennial reign. And again, that begs the question, who are the sinners and what is the nature of the sin? As I live, declares the Lord God, surely with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out, I will be king over you. The question becomes, when they say the wrath poured out, is that historic? Is that the great tribulation? Or is there continuing to be a wrath of the Lord who's ruling with a rod of iron, meaning inflexible, ruled by the law? Is that rod of iron meant for all the inhabitants unglorified in the millennial reign? Or is it meant just for the Gentiles? I will bring you out from the peoples and gather you out of the countries where you are scattered. And with a mighty hand and an outstretched arm and with wrath poured out. He's pulling them through the great tribulation. And there's certainly a wrath that the people have to come through. But will the wrath continue? And I will bring you into the wilderness of the peoples, and there I will enter into judgment with you face to face. This is a really interesting scene where we pull together Ezekiel, Daniel, and Matthew 24. As I entered into judgment with your fathers in the wilderness of the land of Egypt, so I will enter into judgment with you, declares the Lord God. I will make you pass under the rod, and I will bring you into the bond of the covenant. The picture here is the shepherd and the sheep are coming to the sheep coat, to the, to the secure place, the millennial reign. And he's going through and he's saying, 
here's a good one, here's a bad one, here's a good one, here's a bad one. Is it meant just for the Jews? No. All the nations will be gathered in his presence. And he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. And then the king will say to those on his right, come you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom. All the nations, Jews and Gentiles, are coming before that rod. And those that are saved to the right hand of the kingdom. And those that are lost. I will purge out the rebels from among you. And those who transgress against me. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn. They're talking about the diaspora, the Jews that have been spread all over the, the world. I will bring them out of the land where they sojourn but they shall not enter the land of Israel. Who? The rebels, the lost. Then you will know that I am the Lord. How many Jews get to go into the millennial reign and how many don't? In the whole land, declares the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish. Only one third of the Jewish nation will come into the millennial reign. In the whole land, declares the Lord, two thirds shall be cut off and perish and one third shall be left alive. And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver. This is the great tribulation. This is the judgment he's talking about and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. We're going to see the notion of the transgression of Jacob expanded here. And it's going to hone in on the meaning of the word ungodliness. Lest you be wise in your own sight, I do not want you to be unaware of this mystery, brothers. A partial hardening has come upon Israel until the fullness of the Gentiles has come in. That's where we are right now. I know a Jewish man right now. He's got more education that I can't even imagine. But when I talk about Christology, the Bible says, if, if our gospel be hid, it is hid to them that are lost, in whom the God of this world hath blinded the minds of them. There's a difference between the fullness of time, the fullness of the Gentiles, and the time of the Gentiles. The fullness of the Gentiles, that's when the church is complete. And then the rapture, and that's when the scales fall off the nation of Israel. Some will be saved during that great tribulation period, and some will not. The time of the Gentiles deals with when the Gentiles rule over Israel. In the context of Daniel, it started with Babylon, and it ends with the Antichrist. Who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Shall a land be born in one day? Jeremiah said, can a leopard change its spots? A leopard can't change its spots. But the Lord can and did change my heart. Can a land be born in a day? Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? Yes. On that day, there shall be a fountain open for the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem to cleanse them from sin and uncleanness. We're going to talk about that river, that fountain. It's both physical and spiritual. Physically, the Bible tells us, and we're going to see a map shortly, that there'll be an earthquake that splits Israel north to south and out from underneath the threshold of the temple will flow living waters. And it is that flow of living waters that is going to cleanse the people from sin and uncleanness. Will it cleanse them on day one and you've got all the rest of the millennial reign? Or will it continue to cleanse the Jewish people who come and realize that he is the Messiah? That they get saved just like I did. I saw myself as lost and undone and without hope. So here's that map I was telling you about. Jesus is coming back on a Mount of Olives. He's going down through the Kidron Valley. 
And as he's coming down, maybe beforehand, when he sets foot on the Mount of Olives, there'll be an earthquake that splits the land. The topography is going to change. We just talked about the mountains melting away. Jerusalem will ultimately be absolutely the high point on the earth, and the waters will flow. That's all Zechariah 14. Ezekiel 47 talks about the Dead Sea. The Bible says and the, the fishermen will hang their nets along En Gedi to Englam. In other words, there's going to be fishing in the Dead Sea. Well, I was in the Dead Sea. It isn't just dense that I started bobbing before the water hit my waist. There's a little sign there that said, if you've got any open wounds, any scratch, do not go in that water. It'll eat you alive. And yet that living water is going to flow and refresh that particular piece of real estate. So six infinitives and 11 minutes. I think we're going to be facing <laughs> part four. To finish the transgression, she will bear a son and you shall name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. Remember, I said three milestones, two recipients. He died for all men. Why did he die? To save his people from their sins. And a redeemer will come to Zion, to those in Jacob, who turn from transgression. Micah 1.5, what is the transgression of Jacob? And in this day, all Israel will be saved. As a nation, the nation will be saved. Will the individuals continuing on be saved? Study your Bible. The deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. We talked about Micah. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. That's what Armageddon was all about. And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy on that day. Will they continue with the, those that are born? And I will pour out on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy so that when they look on me, on whom they have pierced, they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one weeps over a firstborn. And one shall say unto him, what are these wounds in thine hands? And then he shall answer, those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. He came unto his own and his own received him not. But to as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Jewish people were saved, the 12 apostles, the 11 of the 12 apostles. Paul was a Jew. The early church was exclusively Jew. But then Paul said that a hardening of the hearts, a partial hardening. And on that day, I will seek to destroy all the nations that come against Jerusalem. We just read that verse. The transgression of Jacob will not be finished until Israel as a nation repents and turns to God. Same question. See the triple X's. To put an end to sin. Jesus said, it is finished. When World War II ended, you know, they signed the peace treaty and Japan surrendered. But there were soldiers on all those occupied islands that didn't get the news. So the war was over, but there were battles continuing as we're trying to get these guys and, and figure out that the war is all over. Jesus died once for all. He won the war, but I'm still in a battle. I win some, I lose some. So on the cross, Jesus put an end to sin, but its ramifications still live in me today. For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly once. 
For then he would have had to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he appeared once for all. He died for all the sins, past, present, and future. He died for all the people, past, present, and future. And in this way, all Israel will be saved. As it is written, the deliverer will come from Zion. He will banish ungodliness from Jacob. So what does that word ungodliness mean? It comes with a prefect that means not. And then the word itself that means devout or religious or worship. If a body says, oh, he's ungodly in the way we talk today, you might say, well, that means he's, he's a scoundrel. He, he, he is, he's not moral. But that's not what the word ungodliness means. The word ungodliness means no God. Thou shalt not have strange gods before me. The punishment of your iniquity, O daughter of Zion, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. This is the book of Lamentations. This is Jeremiah who wrote this while the people were exiled in Babylon. And he says, this is the con this is the purpose. He says, the punishment of your iniquity, Israel, is accomplished. He will keep you in exile no longer. Why did they go into exile? Idolatry. Why were they being pulled? Why will they have been pulled out of exile for the millennial reign? Idolatry no longer. On that day, declares the Lord of hosts, I will cut off the names of the idols from the land so that they shall be remembered no more. We read that already. Number three, and to atone for iniquity. That word at one was invented by Tyndale in his first translation to the English Bible. He, there was no English word that says, you know, bring them together. And he came up with at one atonement. Then he shall kill the goat. This comes from Leviticus, which is a picture of Jesus on the cross. Then he shall kill the goat of the sin offering that is for the people and bring its blood inside the veil and do with its blood as he did with the blood of the bull, sprinkling it over the mercy seat and in front of the mercy seat. And thus he shall make at one moment for the holy place because of the uncleanness of the people of Israel and because of their transgressions, all their sins. All their sins? Is it just idolatry? Is it all, all, all of their sins? That was Leviticus. Here's the New Testament counterpart. He entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of blood of goats and calves as above, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. Isaac asked his dad a question. Where's the lamb? A couple thousand years later, John the Baptist answered the question. He says, behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And how are people saved? Old Testament, New Testament. And the question becomes, is the millennial reign a difference? How are people saved? They see themselves without hope, and they believe God. The Bible says, Abraham believed God, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. And so that's how Paul could write in Galatians, there's neither Jew nor Gentile, there's neither Jew nor Greek, there's neither slave nor free, there's neither male or female, we're all one in Christ Jesus. If you've been saved, we're in this thing together. Therefore, he had to make like his brothers in every respect, so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God, to make propitiation, to be the substitutionary sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. He is that substitution, and not for ours only, but for the sins of the whole world. A hyper cabinet would talk about a limited atonement, someone who, uh, who believes that Jesus died just for those that in his infinite wisdom and his sovereign power would be saved. Jesus died for everybody. He died and he paid for the sins of the whole world. 